Hello, and welcome to the Professor Podcast with Ruth and Claire. Each episode, we talk about a particular topic in the life of a professor. Ruth is a visiting professor at a large university in Ireland, and Claire is an associate professor at a primarily undergraduate university in Northern California. The purpose of our podcast is reflection, so we bring something we think is working and something we're working on to discuss. Welcome to the Professor Podcast with Ruth and Claire. I'm Ruth. And I'm Claire. And today we're talking about Ruth's first experience with a large class. But first, Ruth, how was your week? My week was good. Everything I... <laughs> I don't know, this probably isn't interesting to anyone else, but I'm like, it's getting dark real early. (laughs) Like, the days are very short. So I feel like I'm the only person who is enamoured by this and the kids are deeply not enamoured. And everyone else who's been living in Ireland for the last 10 years is like, and what about it? Happens every um, year. (laughs) I know, for some reason I'm like, whoa, because it's like 4pm now and it's kind of getting to the, it's dark when I bring the kids to school and then it's dark when I pick them up. Oh my goodness, you've already reached that yeah, I know. So it does feel like you kind of like, I know there's different holidays, um, you know, in lots of different cultures. And but it seems like it's a really like common thing that light is part of the winter holiday. It does. And it really you feel it like when you're driving to school in the morning in the pitch dark and then you see all of the lights hanging on people's balconies oh. and apartments. And you're like, oh, there they are. And like, it is, it's very, yeah, it's good. And I went for a swim this morning and oh, Oh boy, it was real chilly. <laughs> so it's definitely gotten back to submerge and go. Like no wow. more just luxuriating in the water. So <laughs> yeah, that was that was interesting. Wow. But how are you? How was your week? Oh, my week was good. I mean, so I'm in Los Angeles and it's I feel like it's getting dark early, so I can only imagine it I really do. <laughs> <laughs> I know, because I found like I think I've told you this before, but when I was in where we lived before to me, it was so not, um, it wasn't as extreme. Mm-hmm. So I didn't really feel like it was really summer, even mm-hmm. though it was a million degrees hotter, but it just because it wasn't bright until like 11 p.m. or whatever. So Right. So it didn't feel yeah. like summer to you because it was getting dark at 9 p.m. or something instead <laughs> totally. of 11. How interesting. It's, yeah. So it's yeah. weird, like just this extreme mm-hmm. sort of thing over here. But yeah. Mm-hmm. So sorry, what were you saying? Oh, well, so my week was good. I've been on the search. I can't remember if I mentioned this on the podcast, but I'm on an ongoing search um, for the perfect chocolate cake recipe. Ooh. And I think I've hit on the perfect chocolate frosting. And so I wanted to share that with everybody. It's like, it's actually from my youth. It's from the... um, Good housekeeping cookbook, which was one Dude, of the don't cookbooks. mess with the classics. I know that's the thing. If it isn't broke, you don't know how to fix it. So yes, I'm a hundred percent behind this. Exactly. Sorry, go ahead. It's just so what it's, is it? So it's 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 just powdered sugar, butter. I I use a vegan butter, but you can use whatever mm. butter you want. So powdered sugar, butter, melted unsweetened chocolate, and a little mm. bit of milk. And I really think the unsweetened chocolate is the key to the flavor. That's just really rich and yeah. delicious. And and I I'm you know. There are ratios, like, I, yeah, you know, about a cup and a half of powdered sugar and a couple of tablespoons of butter, a couple of tablespoons of milk, one square of unsweetened chocolate melted. But I always just kind of mix them together and then I'm like, oh, let's add a little more milk or let, you know, so oh. I, I kind of just go for That's it. So you're I think- a chemist. Like, uh, I'm <laughs> yeah. like, no, I just stick with the recipe. I don't know how to. <laughs> just like, you're, you're able to. That's cool. And so is the cake also? The cake, I, you- I, I, I feel like. I'm, I can't report the perfect chocolate mm. cake part yet. Still working on that. There's lots of good ones out there. If anyone has their favorite chocolate cake recipe, definitely send it my oh, way. Yeah. But um, I think the ultimate chocolate cake would have this frosting I'm describing on the outside and then some kind of like more like fluffy like um, mousse or something on the inside. Oh, so I'm still okay. working. I'm also in the market for mousse recipes if anyone has one of those. So I had a really good chocolate cake recipe, but it is Ooh. gluten and egg free. So who knows? Well, that's, but I feel like I'll try the relevant thing was like to put the cocoa powder in boiling water. Oh, yes. I've seen or that. something. To and that, it, like, yeah. And that really helped. But I can't remember any other details. But that's. Yeah. Well, if you find the recipe. Okay. Send I will, it I will, yeah. I'm trying. Let's see. Lots of them. <laughs> I have a feeling that a gluten free cake is not going to be the best chocolate cake you mm. ever had. <laughs> you never know. There could be <laughs> elements of it. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um. Yeah, so I have a quote today. Excellent. And it's sort of relevant to, well, you'll find out. Anyway, so it's by, <laughs> um, I heard an interview this week with Jane Fonda that was just so amazing and really inspiring and just awesome. But her, the quote is, it's never too late, never too late to start over and never too late to be happy. And so, yeah, 
I think that's really um, helpful. Yeah, what a good remember. reminder. Yeah, and sometimes, yeah, anyway, because I will tell you about it later. Sorry, <laughs> go ahead with what we're talking about today. Um, yes, so today um, you're going to talk to me about large lectures. Yes, so you had your first experience teaching a large class. Mm-hmm. Would you tell us a bit about, like, what's your previous experience, normal class yes. size? You worked at Cal Poly and Cal Poly Humboldt, and I don't really know how the different class sizes translated, but tell us, tell us the background. Yeah, so in Cal Poly Slow, Mm -hmm. There was like a limit. So there was 48 students in the class and they were always full. And so that was, and then one time they had a large lecture class, which was 70. And I taught that. And I found the 70 was like, oh, that was a lot. Like that Uh was really stressful. And then in Cal Poly Humboldt, the classes there were usually pretty small. So once in a blue moon, I would have 48, but often it was 20 or one lovely semester, we only had 11. Mm -hmm. And so it was usually way, way smaller. So Mm -hmm. I've never done anything like this. So Mm -hmm. the class that I taught this semester, it was really unusual in two ways. One was I taught the second half of the semester. I've never Mm -hmm. done that before. Have you? No, I've never switched who's the instructor midway through the semester. That's really interesting. Yeah. And then I, it was 350 people mm-hmm. and it was in a room that was like, like stadium type seating and just so different to anything I've done before. That's fascinating because I'm sure so much of your teaching style has developed around these smaller so classes that much. you're used to. And so you must have had to make quite a big intentional changes to figure out how to translate that larger class size. Yeah, I think what we're going to find through this episode is I do not endorse teaching larger classes. So <laughs> that's that's going to be, yes. But it is, like you said, very much coming from having really developed this whatever style or whatever the, it is that I do. You know, sometimes you don't think you have a teaching style. Mm-hmm. You're like, no, I just bumble in there and it happens. And then now I'm like, I really have a teaching style <laughs> and this is not it. So, yeah, that was so weird. So what? Um, The first thing that comes to mind when I'm thinking about switching from being used to small class sizes to doing a larger class is, what about group work? Like, did you do any kind of group work in the class? Did you do any kind of group work out of class? Uh, Did did that just totally go away? What? Tell me about that. that. And that was the killer. Like, that was the thing that really killed me. Um, So I, the class that I used to teach in Humboldt was, like, we had two lectures a week. We had one three-hour lab, and then we had one tutorial or, like, activity section. And to me, the activity section is where the magic happens. Like, labs are really good, but I really think problem solving and stuff, especially in the beginning of physics, you just really need to get those skills down. So this group, um, there was, they had labs, but each of the labs was with a different instructor. You know what I mean? And so the person who taught the first half of the course has these amazing inquiry-based labs that are really great. And he was just in charge of that. And that was, so I wasn't involved with that at all. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really unfortunate that they don't have any problem solving sessions. And Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So I think, yeah, I'm going to ramble on about it a lot. But I think one thing is like, I've heard of other people doing really cool active learning stuff with a large lecture, Mm -hmm. but it needs to have resources and you need to have Mm -hmm. teaching assistants and like in-class helpers or There's like the learning assistant network, I think. I don't know this. Um, Do you remember we talked to Ben and... Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they they were part of the LA, like the learning assistant network or something. But it's something about hiring learning assistants. I think their program is also looking at the benefit for the learning assistants. But anyway, so I think without that, I think it's really difficult to try and get people to engage in that way. And so what you're talking about is if it's just you and students are doing some active learning in the classroom, there's not enough of you to walk around to all the groups. Is that kind of what you're saying? But if you had some teaching assistants, learning assistants Mm -hmm. in the classroom with you, you could do that kind of thing. Right. Like, I think I'm sure you can be really successful with like doing that. But Mm -hmm. I, without the kind of extra resources, I don't know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if I, you know what I mean? That makes sense. And so did I understand correctly? They had labs in presumably smaller numbers of students per lab but you didn't teach any of those so you weren't actually interacting with them in in even the the smaller group of a lab yeah okay Mm -hmm. and even the labs i think each lab has 60 in it Mm -hmm. okay so So that's pretty big yeah lots of big numbers what about like clickers or like in class think pair share chat with your neighbor kind of things were you did you do any of those or did, did, did that not really fit with what you needed to cover in the in the lecture 
Do you know, so I didn't, I did and I didn't. So I didn't do it in a formal way. Um, I think partly like I just was so overwhelmed. Sure. Like I genuinely was absolutely like felt ill going into the first ah. class. It was so bad. So like, I, I don't know if I had, I think I was kind of going with, you know, what we talked about the first semester you teach, just do the basics yes. and, you know, do that. So I didn't, I did do things like where I'd ask them a question and then say like, hold up one finger or two fingers oh, cool. if you think mm-hmm. it's this or that. And I was surprised, like a lot more people engaged with that than I expected. Mm-hmm. I just thought it would be a wall of like nothing. Do you know what I mean? So <laughs> I definitely was pleasantly surprised about that. That's um, but I didn't do like, and again, I don't know. Like, I think with forward planning, maybe I could have done clickers, but mm-hmm. I don't know if I could come in in the middle of the semester and be like, go and buy this. Yeah. Thing. That you know, sense. like, and mm-hmm. so maybe the clickers would have been good, but I just didn't kind of have the mm-hmm. bandwidth or whatever to do it. Totally. So I definitely did like chat with your neighbor and, but it just was so, it felt really ineffective because normally when I do chat with your neighbor, like I lurk around you and it's quite clear. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. It's really clear when someone has moved on to talking about like the new Marvel movie and you're like, oh, OK, <laughs> and we're back to it. like, you know what I mean? And so this, though, was it was just hard to get a vibe, do you know, of mm-hmm. what was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that I found a little weird. Yeah. I mean, that makes so much sense. And I know that. I mean, I've experienced as well. The first day in a lecture is always scary, but even more so if there's something new about it, if you haven't yeah. had the class before, if you don't know what to expect from the student. But then, yeah, if it's a totally different type of class, yeah, I, it makes sense that this is like back to first semester teaching mode of oh. let's just get the content out. And, and and you don't have kind of like go to, here's what I normally do when I'm in a large class setting. Let's just improv it because you haven't done that before. So that makes perfect sense. But even like the teaching materials were so different because oh. like all of my teaching up till now has involved just writing on the board. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? And then like maybe I'd have PowerPoint slides for think pair share questions or something or like if, if a particularly challenging diagram for me to draw, which is most <laughs> diagrams. But, um, yeah, so like I would use that. But this... Um, Both when I was teaching online last semester, there's just an expectation here that there is PowerPoint slides. Mm -hmm. And I managed to kind of make it halfway where I wrote on the, so I'd make slides, turn them into a PDF and then write on the blank slides, Mm -hmm. which I'm really bad at estimating how many blank slides. Like sometimes (laughs) I'd leave like five blank slides for like one, anyway, it was just, so this then like, so in this lecture hall, there was like a little kind of pulpit thing, mm-hmm. like a little box. And it was weird that it was off to one side. So you were more looking at one side of the room than the <laughs> other side. Uh-huh. And then that was microphoned. Okay. Because Did I you don't have to think... stay there to be on the yes. microphone? Yeah. So you stayed, you kind of walked up these stairs into mm-hmm. the little pulpit thing. Mm-hmm. And then you were in there. And then I wanted to write on my iPad, but you couldn't connect the iPad to the screen. Mm. So instead, it was just so ridiculous, but like I would have to have a Zoom meeting and then invite my iPad to the Zoom (laughs) meeting and then let my iPad share their screen. And like, I just, oh my God, like for some reason doing that sequence of events in the nine minutes since the last professor left to when I was starting was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And then like the first day I got there, the plug I have, like I couldn't, whatever way there was a lamp in front of the, like I couldn't fit it in. And I was just like watching my laptop battery go lower and lower. Just, oh. oh my God, this is such a nightmare. So it was definitely that, like just the extra sort of technology made me remember just the luxury of just like strolling into a classroom and picking up a piece of chalk and going right. from there. Like it was so different to have just these elements of, yeah. You're making me think too, just like familiarity with the classroom, with the technology, yeah. but like mm-hmm. even, yeah, so strolling in and picking up chalk is super simple. But it's so much easier if you know the classroom and you know that, oh, this oh, board yeah. slides up and this board, like, oh. you know, the first year I taught in a classroom where the chalkboard slid around, like all the time I kept writing oh, on the God. one chalkboard that didn't move and then I needed to move it. Oh, and, but now I think that that just is so anyway. It's, it's automatic. Yeah. Well, I, and every time I would like finally get everything up on the screen and mm-hmm. it was two huge screens mm-hmm. and I would 
always put my email up there like, every time <laughs> I was like what am I doing Classic. like I would be like noodling around and stuff and then I'd be like oh god it's on the like it's up there isn't it and it's like oh god <laughs> no, I don't problem. even know what they saw on there so that again not a lot of dignity with that mm-hmm. so yeah mm-hmm. I remember teaching that w- like we'd have presentations at the end of the semester and I would have the, uh, them just use my laptop for the presentations because we didn't want to switch between everybody's yeah. different devices but that meant like some of them would have their how did it work? For some reason, YouTube would be there. For some reason. But then after YouTube, it like YouTube suggests all these videos. And I was like kind of embarrassed that whatever videos were coming up <laughs> were associated with me, even though it's just YouTube suggesting them. And like, it was, oh, <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Um, so what about in a small lecture, we've kind of talked about you. I feel like maybe we try to get a variety of people to talk in the lecture. We try to um, yeah, just trying to make it comfortable for everybody to speak. In a large class, of course, not everybody's going to speak in the lecture. So how did that go? Were you were you worried at all about um, the conversation being dominated by a couple people asking questions? Or was that okay because they were volunteering the questions? Yeah, how, how did that how did that translate That's for you? Such a good question. And that felt kind of gross. Like I was not paying attention to that at all. Mm-hmm. And honestly, like I, this is a real broad generalization and it's based on limited teaching. But I think Irish students are just generally mortified and embarrassed. And like <laughs> most people don't ask that many questions. Do you uh, know what I mean? So um, it was the like... the culture to not have those back and forth. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, a little bit more. And I think it was interesting at first, it was more the non-Irish students who were asking questions. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? And I think... Um, yeah, so I think that was good and that kind of broke the ice. And then it got better as it went along. Like people kind of chimed in more and more. With stuff and like the first day, because I always do problems and then I make them calculate them, mm-hmm. and it's really disingenuous because I've I've done the problem like I know the number, but I'm like, can anyone calculate that for me? And they just looked horrified. They were like, what is this woman doing? But then they got in the spirit of it, and you could hear all the calculators clacking away, and they you know would do it. And anyway, so that worked out well. But um, yeah, I definitely uh, it was not like there was. There was a gr- there was a group for sure mm-hmm, who were mm-hmm. really engaged and got mm-hmm. like stronger and stronger with chiming in and asking questions and that all got a lot better, but it was certainly like I don't know one percent of the class or like t- maybe maybe ten percent of the class, but not most of them. Do you think it always seems to me like there's probably some percentage of the students who are not chiming in but are still benefiting from the other people yeah. chiming in? And that's did, a really did you feel good like point. That was the case. I do. And I think I actually had, um, like office hours are not a really common thing here either. And Mm -hmm. so I had an office hour that was like pretty well attended. So maybe Mm -hmm. there would be like 30 or 40 people. And that was very different. That was much more, I would just, I would still write on the iPad. It was in a different room. So I could just do that without having the whole rigmarole, but I just would write on it. And like, it was much more like my old style of teaching instead of like PowerPoint slides and everything. And then I could like set them a question and walk around and ask them. And that Mm. felt so good and so much more like my jam. That's cool. I was going to ask you about office hours and whether they were swamped, but it sounds like they were just a totally different format uh, than... than, Well, I only had one a week, which is kind of wild. So one hour a week. And I booked like a room and we just went in there and did it in there. So it was kind of like another classroom. And did you have it like pre-planned, like we're just going to do these kind of problems or did people ask questions and you... People just asked, they were like, can you talk about this or can you, Mm -hmm. can we do a problem on specific heat or whatever Mm -hmm. it was. And Mm -hmm. so that was, that was the extent of it. That's cool. I mean, that sounds a lot like the activity sections, but more like they get to elect if they come and they get to kind of direct what it's like a hybrid between activity sections and and office hours in, in, in the way that I think of them. So that's really cool. The one, the other thing that <laughs> my big list of complaints, but one thing I really found difficult, I didn't know any of the students. Like uh. I definitely did because there's like a group who came to stuff, but I would have like whole email conversations with people and you wouldn't know and have they no like. idea who that was. And then like people would come up and ask you things, but it was just all so chaotic. It wasn't like you, you know, what? Like, it was just, I, I found that really disconcerting to not mm-hmm. have like any idea who anyone was do you know that, that was is really weird. interesting yeah yeah mm-hmm. and it definitely was not my favorite <laughs> yeah it is really nice to make those connections and see the individuals yeah. improve and um 
So one thing I'm wondering about is how did you grade everything? And did it change the assignment types that you had yes. because you knew you had to grade 300 of them? And how did 100%. that all work? Uh-huh. Yeah. So this class um, is like an online homework system. Okay. And so like I wasn't involved really with grading it at all. Do you know what I mean? So I would set the homework and then you could kind of see, but it's like 350 people. So I'm not like, oh, how did Jane do? Do you know? Like it's, yeah. yeah. And so the numbers just kind of appear based on how they did on their online totally. activity. Right. Uh huh. Yeah. And like, really, I'm sort of weird about online homework sometimes because I really love in the beginning of physics to really like encourage a certain style of problem solving ah, and like yes. really laying out all of the work. And so like, I really, it would be really cool to, like, I really like being in a small class where that can be graded. Do you mm-hmm, know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I think obviously there's just no way of doing that with 350 people, like mm-hmm. not in a million years. And it's really, it's great that they have these homeworks so they can get the practice in. But um, yeah, it's just a shame that you can't kind of get at you know, why, or like solving the problems. And I had a student who was super nice, but she was like, it was something like unlimited tries. So you could just try. So she was like, I would just multiply all the numbers together mm. over and over again until I was like, oh boy, that is not what we're trying to get out of this. Right. You know what I mean? So that, yeah, but the exam is going to be in person for the first time in a long time, because I think Last year, they tried to do it with this online system and it crashed halfway mm. through. Oh, no. And so, I know. And so, they're going to do an in-person exam, but then that's going to be kind of intense. My last week of work is going to be grading these 350. Oh, my goodness. I know, now, did you wild. write the exam? Yeah. And again, here, it's a little different that, like, you have to submit the exams. Like, uh, you know, I had to submit them, I think it was, was at the end of October. It was before mm. I started teaching. Wow, class. before you started the second half of the mm-hmm. semester, you had to submit your final exam. Yes. And that sounds like that's the only exam that you're giving them. Right. Did, and yeah, so, so mm-hmm. yeah, so that feels super weird. And it's fine because I was pretty conservative in terms of not putting on the thing that I thought I was going to cover in the last week of class. You know uh-huh, what I mean? so, yeah, that was wise of you. Yeah, big time. And so that I think it's fine, but that's kind of stressful, like, to... Yeah, it's just weird to, like, I found that weird to haven't mm-hmm. got, like, not really having a scope of where the class is at or what they could handle. And then, you know, but they're all, the exams are kind of, like, overseen by, like, sometimes external examiners. And there's a whole formality process that isn't the case. That's interesting. In so in we Ireland, are like, are you going to be a proctor or will you have additional proctors or will you not even be there? How will that work? So that's really, it's really, so it's all anonymous tests. So it's just student numbers on the test and mm-hmm. you can't, I mean, to be honest though, I think even if you had the names at 350 people, sure, you know, there's literally no way, mm-hmm. right. And there's no way you're paying attention to like, oh, is this Joan? Like how is she doing? Or, you know, whatever. So there's a big examination hall mm-hmm. and they just go in and it could be like four separate classes are in the examination hall at that time Mm -hmm. and there's hired like they hire often it's phd students to go and proctor Mm -hmm. but we like have to be available on the phone and then maybe we pop in just in case there's some weird thing like Like everyone doesn't know what's up with Mm -hmm. question three or something i see yeah totally so um so yeah so that's yeah it's all very to me it felt so crazy the first time i was teaching in the states and it was just like yeah, finals are next week. Just write your final. And you're like, what? <laughs> like, that's just, that's what's happening. But I like that, like the flexibility. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, sure. and really a lot of autonomy to mm-hmm. just do whatever you think makes sense with your class. Totally. So, that's interesting. It's, it's really interesting yeah. to see the contrast between the different countries. I know that's not what the I topic know. of the episode is, but I'm glad to have. Oh, yeah, it's super interesting. And I feel like I've said so many negative things. I want to say a positive thing. Okay, great. What's the positive thing? Yeah. There was a couple of classes that went really well. Okay. And like, it was just like people, even people right up the back, like people were just popping questions off and it was just like, and it was such a buzz. Like it was a magnified, you know, when you'd have a really good class and you're like, everyone is connected. Like it's just Mm -hmm. feels like everyone's tuned in. It was like that, but like magnified, right? Because there's 300 of everybody tuned in. That's awesome. How exciting. 
just to be clear, I don't think 300 people were attending well, most sure, of the time. Okay, so, but a, yeah, a but there percent. was, and it was actually last week. And then this week was my last class. And as I was going to talk about at the end of this episode, I am not going to be teaching in my new position that I'm taking up in the future. So I was kind of having this sentimental, like, this is my last lecture and I've been teaching and I was going to like maybe make a speech. And then a whole bunch of people who haven't been coming to class came oh, and were so rude and talking. I ended up like having a tantrum oh, and no. having to be like, okay, stop everything. Can all of the people who are not interested in being here just like leave? Like it was like, it was terrible. And then they had to go. And I think people who stayed behind were great. And then we did have a good mm-hmm. end of the class, but it was not like the big dramatic like moment in the sun I was hoping for for me. Dun, dun, dun. And so, yeah. So I think that was something that I did not enjoy either. I think that when you're in such a big crowd, it can kind of feel like you're watching someone on television Mm -hmm. and you forget that those Mm -hmm. people can see you and hear you and you're disturbing other people in the Mm -hmm. room. That makes sense. So that was definitely difficult. But like when it worked, it felt amazing. I was like, that was my rock star stadium moment. That's awesome. Let's go back. So you said the week before last, when things Mm -hmm. were going awesomely, what was, what was, what was different? Do you think everybody was just kind of knew how the class was going and, and was feeding off each other and feeling comfortable or, or what, what, what was magical about that week? I think it was that, I think that they had finally gotten used to, cause I think they at first they were like, what is she doing? Like, why is she asking us these questions? And, but it kind of felt like just everyone had their calculators out straight away mm-hmm. and everything, you know, they just seemed kind of tuned in and just sort of, I don't like, that's a good question. I'm not sure I have a good answer. I think there was a bit of trust building and mm-hmm. like, they kind that of were sense. like, with the program of what was going on. Mm-hmm. And then I think too, like it sounds awful, but like probably the people who were coming are the kind of more motivated ones. And mm-hmm. so that kind of helps. Um, <laughs> just in my other big long list of complaints, there was another thing I did not like, which was one, there was three lectures a week. And one of the days was two back to back, which was mm-hmm. that got like, by the end of the second hour, there was a lot more, like crowd control than I would like to be dealing with. You mean with. the you know students I mean? were there for two, the length of two lectures in a row? Yeah, or so you, we had okay. two back to back and it was like the same group of students. And so I see. So they had I'm to sit through sure. twice as long a lecture yeah. as usual. That does seem difficult. And we did have a break and they went off and came back, but then that's its own like Sure, that takes forever. <laughs> right. And it's like just everyone sort of giddy when they come back. And so anyway, it's just yeah. But well, um, kudos yeah. to you for getting the large class on board with something that it sounds like they really weren't used to, which was having their yeah. calculators out and doing activities during the class and and being on board, especially since it sounds like you only had a few weeks, like you were only teaching this class. It was uh, expedited, right? You've only had five well, weeks. It was five weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it was really good. And I think they were, you know, like they're super sweet. Do you know what I mean? And they were really like they were like, OK, if this is what we're doing and they kind of got with the program. And Mm -hmm. so, Mm -hmm. yeah, I think they were really nice. And then I think there is part of me that wonders if I had been the first half, sure, maybe it would have been different. But I think a lot of them were like, oh, there's a final coming up. And so that definitely changed a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And so some of them were like, "Um, does the homework count towards my, like there was a lot of people suddenly like, yeah. And so I think that... Yeah, maybe that's why they were engaged too. But anyway, I, I, there was definitely, in particular, there was one day where I came out just feeling like I'd performed like a concert or something. That's so I was fun. like, woohoo. So that was Rockstar, cool. I like right? that aspect. That's yeah. wonderful. And so I think my big takeaway is I can see why large lectures are really beneficial for universities financially, but I really think it's important to invest in other resources to support that. Do you know what I mean? And so, I think like my colleague who taught the first half has invested a huge amount of time in developing these labs. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what makes this course like is really successful. Mm -hmm. But I think um, there could be more stuff happening like in the lecture, if you know Mm -hmm. what I mean, Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. in terms of resources and having teaching assistants and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Mm -hmm. that sounds great. Yeah. So it was it was it was weird. (laughs) <laughs> well, thanks right. so much for sharing your story, Ruth. It's really interesting oh, to hear about switching to a whole different style of class yeah. and, and the, the challenges and, and insights you got from that. Yeah. And it's, 
I mean, I guess because I should have said maybe at the beginning too, because I like my in person classes were all in Humboldt, but then mm-hmm. here I've been teaching this completely different demographic uh-huh. of like the secondary school teachers. They're so different because these kids were also freshmen, which we didn't, I didn't teach freshmen very often in Humboldt. Mm-hmm. Like usually we got physics majors in at least their second year. Mm-hmm. So that mm-hmm. was different too. I see. So this yeah. is a whole new demographic. I mean, they're they're in Ireland and their first mm-hmm. years and you're not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's all kinds of new demographic. Yeah, totally. So it was interesting. So did you want to tell us about you are, this is your last time teaching at the this university and, and you're in a switch? Yeah, yeah. So I have a new job starting in the new year. Congratulations. That I'm going to go to. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and it's going to be more like working with students behind the scenes sort mm-hmm. of stuff, like supporting students. So um, I will love to report back a little bit more about that in the new year. But it feels weird. Like part of me, I feel like I was asking the person who's going to be my boss, like, so what does one do in the day? Because it feels like so much of our job is focused around, I have this class I have to give, I'm going to prepare the class. So part of me is like, what is a normal job that doesn't involve, I mean, I guess there's projects and things, but it's just, I feel very institutionalized to teaching. So it's going to be weird. Yeah, sure. sure. We're we're used to the the schedule of classes appears on our calendar and you know that you will have a syllabus for each one of them. <laughs> yeah. Right. And you fit things in around all of mm-hmm. those things, but that's the main skeleton of your day. So mm-hmm. yeah, that will be interesting. Yeah. Sure. I can't wait to learn more about what your new skeleton of your day is when you do more behind the scenes support stuff. Yeah. And I'm excited. It's like in town, like it's in the city center. Cool. So I feel like I'm just going to be very cosmopolitan. and like, Yes. Yeah. Strolling along with your maybe Netflix is going to make a like a show about me. Yes, <laughs> I can see it. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, middle-aged lady out and about in town during the day. So yeah, but um, thank you so much, and yeah, thank you, Ruth. Thanks so much for joining us on the Professor Podcast with Ruth and Claire. We're delighted to have you as a listener, and we would love to hear from you. And if you want to email us, our address is contactprofessorpodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear any of your suggestions for future shows or professor quotes that you might want to share with us, or even just things that have come up for you when you were listening to previous episodes. And if you've been enjoying the podcast, we would love if you would spread the word. So the best way to spread word is by telling people you know, if you think they should listen to it, or you can leave us a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.